to get into where we're going. And again, this week, uh, we're only going to get one verse because we've got a lot to cover in that verse. There's a lot to be said. So we're going to be here, and then we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 4 also to look at an account back there. But uh, as you turn there, as you get your paper out, I want to start at the introduction tonight. This is the Walk of Faith part 4, and it's going to be all of chapter 11. But here we go in the introduction. It says this, we've been looking at chapter 11 in our study of the book of Hebrews the past three weeks. The focus of this chapter is faith, and it is the desire of the writer within this chapter to get his readers to live by faith. And we've talked all about that, so I'm not going to go over that much tonight. We've looked at several points so far. First of all, we looked at the definition of faith. That was in verse 1. It says this, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let me keep going. There are two main statements here in this verse. The first one, faith is the foundation upon which the believer stands as he or she waits on the promises of God. And again, we've been through this, so I'm not going to elaborate on it. I'm just going to skim over it. The second thing, B, faith is the evidence of God's promises. It's a part of our testimony. Our faith in the promises of God changes the way we live, and it's a major part of our testimony. You'll see that tonight. Let me go on. The writer then goes on to point to the need to walk by faith, and that's the personal benefits of faith. Of verse 2, watch what it says. It says, for by it, that's faith, the elders or the Old Testament saints obtained a good report, or there was a witness born unto them. Watch what I have here. The elders slash Old Testament saints received a witness from God when they walked by faith, which was an encouragement to them as they passed through this world and that was significant because that was in it that was to basically say to these people that were holding back in their full commitment to god in the these hebrew believers that if they were willing to commit if they were willing to walk by faith they too would see the results of that which would be an encouragement which would continue to pull them further into the relationship with god okay let me go on uh the writer then gets to the next point, the examples of faith. Watch verse 3. He says this, Through faith we, and that's a very important word, understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. I'll kind of condense that into this statement right here. The example he points to here is the faith which they were, they are already exercising in the creation of, in the order of God's universe. Basically, the writer's saying this, look, you're already exercising faith. Here's something that you have faith in. You believe in the creation. You believe that by the spoken word of God, everything was created, and that by God's word, everything is kept in order. And you don't ever worry about the sun falling out of the sky. You don't worry about stars falling out of the sky. You don't worry whether the sun's going to come up in the morning or whether it's going to set in the evening. You have faith in that. You believe that, you trust in that, so therefore take that same kind of faith and apply it into your life with the promises of God. That's what he's saying in the midst of all of this. And this now brings us to where we are in our study tonight. And this is going to start us into basically a pretty long section, the examples of faith part two. Now let me read for you four through seven. Watch Hebrews 11, four through seven. Here we go. He's going to point to three guys here. Watch this. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Then verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So watch your paper here. Let me walk you through something. We're going to look closely at each of these verses, but before we do, I want to help you to see who the writer has chosen as examples here. He has picked out three men from the pre-flood era, 
After this, he will move on to the patriarchs. But for now, he has much to say concerning Abel, Enoch, and Noah. Now watch what I have here. Now it is in these three men we shall see three points concerning faith. Number one, whenever we look at Abel, we're going to see the worship of faith. Number two, whenever we look at Enoch, we're going to see the walk of faith. Number three, whenever we look at Noah, we're going to see the work of faith. So these three men, the, these guys from the pre-flood era, you got Abel, you got Enoch, and you have Noah. There is a tremendous amount to learn from each of those guys about the subject of faith. So he's going to start where it all began. He's going to start with Abel. So with that said, watch, uh, well, the next title is Abel, the Worship of Faith. But watch 11.4. Here we go. Let me read it, and then we're going to go back to Genesis. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. The end of that is a very interesting statement. We'll touch briefly on that tonight. Let me walk you through something right here. We need to look at this verse in several sections. So here's the first section we're going to look at, 4a. It says this, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So we can't understand all of that until we get back to Genesis 4. So just come on back there. We're done in Hebrews for tonight. The rest of it we'll catch on our paper here. But come on back to Genesis chapter 4. This is what the writer's thinking of. This is the account that he has in mind. It starts in Genesis chapter 4. It's going to run through verse 16, though we're not going to look at all those verses. Chapter 4 of Genesis, verses 1 and 2. Let me read it as you follow along. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And again she bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now just hang on a second. Here are the children that are born to Adam and Eve. We've talked about this before. This is one of my favorite studies in Genesis, so I'm going to try to hold back from going too far in this, but this happened probably, I believe, within about a week after the fall. No longer than that. Because I say that for this reason. God had given a command to Adam and Eve that they were to be fruitful and multiply. They were to fill the, fill the earth. They would have been obedient to that command right away. You got to understand also that we are close to the fountainhead of creation. So the first time they came together, she would have gotten pregnant. There wouldn't have been any fertility problems whatsoever. So the first time they would have come together, she would have gotten pregnant. They would have been obedient to the command. These are the first children. There were no children, listen to me. There were no children born to Adam and Eve before sin entered into the world. Couldn't have been because then they would have been born without the sin nature. You understand that? The sin nature came through Adam. And so the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there weren't any born, but these, I believe, were born shortly after the fall, probably within a week after, probably, and I'll say this, not very long after creation. I don't think it was much more than a week after creation that all of this unfolded. But anyhow, there were two they had two children. They had many more, by the way. They had many more children. If you read through Genesis 4, you find that out. But the, the Bible, the Spirit of God zooms in on these two right here for a very important reason. Because they are two opposite men, which we shall see. Watch what I have on your paper. Here's what it says, under, where it says Genesis 4, 1 through 2. It says, we're introduced here to two of the children of Adam and Eve. Cain grew up to be a farmer. Abel grew up to become a shepherd. Nothing wrong with either profession. 
Cain became a farmer. He, he farmed the land. Abel became the shepherd. He was the keeper of the sheep. Watch verse 3. In the process of time, time passes now. We're further along. They're no longer little kids. They are now men. They are men. But watch this. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. In Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now, just listen to me. Apparently, there was established by God before this a specific place in which they were to bring their offerings because the ver verse 3 says that, that in the process of time that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. So that tells me there was a specific place where it was to be brought, the offering was to be brought. It says that, that, that they brought it, it came to pass in the process of time that they both brought their offerings. So apparently there was also a specific time that had been established when they were supposed to bring their offerings. Watch your paper. Here's what it says. There was an appointed time for man to bring his offerings to God, and there was a specific place where these, I should say, offerings were offered. When these two men brought their offerings, they each brought something different. Cain, let's consider his. He brought of the fruit of the ground, and since he was a farmer, this tells us his offering was the works of his hands. This is, now we'll catch this, this is, by the way, the establishment of the first false religion, which was based upon works. Cain's religion is at the center of every false religion today. You understand that? Anything, any religion today that involves works, you and I doing something to earn God's forgiveness, to earn God's uh, uh, respect anything like that is a branch of that first religion that starts there okay this is the very first false religion it is all wrapped up in works today it comes in many different forms many different shapes the bible has a title for it watch jude 1 verse 11 it says this jude writes woe unto them for they have gone in the way of cain that's what the bible refers to it as the way of Cain. Whenever, when, anytime you think about the way of Cain, it always involves works. Trying to earn the forgiveness of sin. Believing that, that they are good enough and that they can somehow earn God's forgiveness and that they can work for their salvation. Let me read the paragraph. okay right where we left off let me pick that back up right underneath that verse right there at the top of the page this way of Cain is a religion that ignores Calvary and it denies the need of the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sin it rejects the need of a savior as a substitute to pay the penalty for our sins and for the sins of the entire world it is a religion based upon man's efforts to please God, and God despises this religion. It is rejected in every form which it's presented. It is man's attempt to come to God on terms other than what God has established. 
That's what it is. It's the way of Cain. It's about working for salvation. It's about earning the forgiveness of God, which is absolutely impossible. Nobody can do it. In any form of religion that incorporates works, any kind of works, if somebody says this to you, look, you can be saved by believing in Christ plus anything. If they, want, if they add anything to it, then it's a branch off of the way of Cain, and God will not accept that. You, people say this, well, you can, you can be saved if you have faith in Christ plus join the church. Uh-uh. You can have faith in, and you can be saved if you have faith in Christ plus baptism. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. There are so many problems with that teaching. Faith plus anything, anything that is added to it falls under the way of Cain. And listen to me, it is rejected because salvation is by grace through faith. No works whatsoever. There can be absolutely nothing added to it because the moment that we add something to it, then we take credit for it. And God will not have that. Salvation is all of God. It's all about the sacrifice of Christ. So the way of Cain completely ignores Calvary, completely ignores the need for the shedding of blood. Watch 4.4 4 again, if you would. Or, yeah, let me read the first part. In Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. Hold on right there. Come on back here. Abel's offering was different than Cain's, for he brought a lamb that he had sacrificed. The question then is, why did he bring the lamb? The lamb was brought because he knew there was a need for a substitute who would die in his place. But how did Abel know this? How in the world did he know? Where did, where did he come up with that at? Well, right here. Watch Genesis 3.21. You can turn there in your Bible. You can look right on your paper. Here's what happened after the fall. After the curse is pronounced, here's what we read. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now listen. After sin entered into the world, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, what did they cover themselves with? Fig leaves. They covered themselves with fig leaves. God would not accept that. God would only accept the blood of a sacrifice for the atonement for sin. That was it. So the fig leaves were gone. They were taken away. And it says here that the Lord God made coats of skins, plural. So he killed something. Watch this. Here's something which took place after the fall, but before the birth of Cain and Abel. After, after Adam and Eve sinned, they covered themselves with fig leaves, which God would not accept as a covering for sin. So God gave both Adam and Eve an object lesson on that day. He took two animals, probably lambs, and in front of Adam and Eve, God killed them. Now listen to me. That must have been a terrible day that day. I can't imagine. They had never seen death before. Nothing had ever died they didn't know what it meant. They didn't know what it meant. God had told Adam, in the day that you eat of the forbidden fruit, you shall surely die. But he didn't know what it meant. He didn't know what it meant. And that day, God took these two innocent animals, or I don't know how many there were, just says skins of coats, plural. So he took enough to make coverings for them. And right there in front of them, probably cut the throat on the lambs that day. And they watched him die. And, and there was an object lesson in that because it helped Adam and Eve to see the seriousness of sin, the ugliness of sin, the cost of sin. There was so much that was taught by the sacrifice of those animals in order for them to be clothed, in order for their sins to be atoned for that day. It was an object lesson for them. Now, watch this. Uh... These lambs were the substitutes for their sins. Watch this. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Here, uh, I'll just read it. And the Lord God commanded a man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat free, or freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God said, In the day that you eat that, you're going to die. Okay, now watch this. 
God to told, had told Adam in the day in which he would eat of the forbidden fruit, he would die. Both of them did die spiritually. And so the lambs would be the means for them to cover their sins. It had to be that way because watch Romans 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. There had to be a payment that day for the sins that they had committed. And then year after year after year, just like under the Levitical priesthood, there would have to be sacrifices. That's why I say this, that Adam, uh, Abel, and Cain, anybody that was alive there that was going to worship God had a specific place where they brought the sacrifice at a specific time when they brought the sacrifice. But that was the only way to worship God. Through faith in the blood that was shed by the sacrifice. Watch this. This is a picture of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross. This was taught to the children of Adam and Eve. So both Cain and Abel understood that God required a substitute. I could have said this. He required a payment. He required that something had to die. The wages of sin is death. They knew that. They, their, their parents would have taught them that from, from back in Genesis, back before they were born. Their parents would have said, look, here's what happened. Here's what happened, and, and, and here's what God said that we need to do. Let me, let me read that again. This was taught to the children of Adam and Eve, so both Cain and Abel understood that God required a substitute which would die in their place, and the blood of the substitute would cover their sins. And let me show you why I say this. They knew that, and here's how I know that, because Romans 10, 17 says this, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and Abel had the faith. Abel had the saving faith. Abel knew what was required, and he had to have heard that somewhere, and he heard it from his parents. Because they would have taught, no doubt, I can just imagine Adam and Eve sitting them down as they grew up and telling them, hey, you know what, here's the way life used to be, but here's where we're at now, and the reason for that is because of what we've done. But God has made a way. God has made a way for us to be forgiven, and it is through the, blood, the shed blood of an innocent substitute, which ultimately was a picture of Calvary. Let me pick this back up. So Cain and Abel had heard the truth, which was that God required a payment for all sin. So at each appointed time, they were to bring their sacrifices back to Cain. Now watch this. Cain refused to believe he needed a substitute because he did not see himself in his true sinful condition. Abel, on the other hand, brought the lamb because he believed what God had said concerning the cost of sin. The bottom line was Abel came to God on God's terms. That's the difference in these guys. One comes to God admitting that he can't do anything to earn the forgiveness of sin, but it will come through the, the blood of, of, an, of an innocent sacrifice. Not knowing, he didn't understand Calvary. He didn't even know the name of Jesus Christ. He wasn't required to. He didn't have to believe that. You see, in the Old Testament, in order for salvation to take place, they were only accountable for the truth that they had been told. They were told this by their parents, that God was going to send a redeemer that would defeat Satan, and that what they needed to do was they needed to bring a, a sin offering, a blood offering for the atonement for sin. And someday that there would be somehow, some way, that there would be a person, there would be a man that would completely take away their sin. That's all they needed to know. They weren't required. They didn't know everything that we know about Calvary. They had no clue, and they didn't need to know that. They, all they needed to believe was the truth that they had been exposed to and that had been told to them. Cain rejected it. Cain said, I don't need a substitute. I don't need any blood for the covering of my sin. I'm good enough. I'll just give God the works of my hands. God wouldn't accept that. Cain had no faith in a substitute. Cain had no faith in a blood sacrifice. Cain had no faith in what God had said to his parents. None. He had his own mindset. Let me get you back here again. Now let me show you Hebrews 11.4 again. Okay, right here on your paper. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So you understand that now. 
by faith, he believed what God had told his parents. He believed what had been passed down to him. He believed the word of God, that God would forgive him through a blood sacrifice, through the sacrifice of the innocent lamb, God would forgive him. And if he came with a blood sacrifice, then he could, he could then come and he could worship God. He believed that, but it goes on now. Watch this. By the which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. That's what I want to look at now. So let's jump on down here. Here we see that God accepted the offering of Abel, and it was a witness that he was declared righteous. So now we're going to read about that. Just pick it up here in verse 4 and 5 of Genesis 4. I'm going to read all of 4. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So here was the deal. They bring the offerings. Let's hold on a second. They bring the offerings. God accepts one. He rejects the other one. Completely denies the offering of Cain. It's amazing to me, that, and the more I look at this, the more things that come out in my mind. Cain would have nothing to do. He was too dignified to kill a lamb. But he didn't have any problems killing his brother, did he? Too dignified. You know, if, if you look at Cain, if you, were to, if you were to come down through here and you were to grab up all the points of Cain, I could paint a picture of him today. He, comes to, he would come to church every Sunday. He would wear a suit. He would carry a Bible. He would sit in a specific place. He would never be late. He would always be there on time. He would, he would pray. He would read his Bible. He would be the kind of person that you would think would be very upright very moral but all he would be would be religious there's a lot of canes today there's a lot of them that's the picture that's painted here that's the difference in these two guys let me go on let me show you what i got here next paragraph at the bottom here we see that god had respect unto the offering of abel but not unto the offering of cain i'm going to raise you a question how did God let Abel know that he had accepted his offering and that he had rejected Cain's? We're not told how, but most likely it was fire that fell from heaven and consumed the offering of Abel. But the fire never touched Cain's offering. Now, I'm going to show you why I say that. That's very significant. We're not told what happened. All we're told here in Genesis 4 is this. It, it says, Genesis 4, 5, 4, 4 says this. Uh, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. We're not told how, but I, I'm almost for sure that it had to be by fire, and I'll show you why that is. Let me show you several examples of fire consuming the sacrifice. Leviticus 9.24, here's one example, and there's a lot of them. I just pulled two of them out. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted, and fell on their faces. Then 1 Kings 18, 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice in the wood and the stones and the dust licked up the water that was in the trench. And it goes on and on. You can get more verses that talk about the fire that fell from God that consumed the offerings. But you get the picture. And I think that was the case here. Let me show you why I believe that. Watch this. Let me get your mind back to Cain and Abel. What was the significance of the fire which consumed the offering of Abel? Here we go. Fire is symbolic of the judgment of God. So when the fire fell on Abel's sacrifice, it was the judgment of God intended for Abel falling instead on the substitutionary sacrifice. You understand that? The fire that came down and would consume the offerings... That fire was a picture of the judgment of God. And because it fell on the, on the animal that was sacrificed, the, the judgment was originally intended for the sinner. But now the judgment falls on the innocent sacrifice. What a picture of Calvary. And how the judgment of God fell upon Jesus Christ, the judgment that was intended for you and I fell directly on his son 
when God put all the sins of you and I and the entire world on the shoulders of his son, in Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he died for our sins, and his death was the payment for our sins. And he took the judgment of you and I on the cross whenever he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was separated from the Father. That was the judgment. That was the spirit, the second death that was intended for you and I. The fire fell on the offerings, and it was the fire that was intended for the person that brought the offering. But the fire never touched Cain's because God will never accept the works of man. Never will he accept the works of man. Let's go on. Now, we must keep in mind here that it was not the offerings which separated these two men. The offerings were the manifestation of the heart. It was the attitude of the heart which separated these two men. Cain refused to believe the word of God. He refused to believe he needed a substitute. And so he would not come to God by faith in a substitute, but instead he attempted to come to God by his own works, which was pride. Abel had faith that he could worship God through the sacrifice of the substitute. He knew he was a sinner. He knew that God required the shedding of blood for the atonement of sin. Therefore, Abel came to God by faith in the death of the substitute. The lamb he brought was proof of the attitude of his heart. He worshiped God by faith. There you go. That's what the writer of Hebrews is letting them know. Worship is by faith. We come to God by faith in the, subs- in the, death, of Je- faith in the death of Jesus Christ that he was a substitute for us. And so, therefore, we are to live by faith, and that faith applies to our worship. That faith applies to our walk, which we're going to see in Enoch, and that faith applies to our work as we go through life. Watch this. Let me show you Hebrews 11:4 again. I want you to get to the end of this now. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it... He being dead, yet speaketh. Interesting statement. Watch this. Abel's faith still speaks today, for we hear it speak as we study the Word of God. Let me stop for a moment. You remember, well, I'll get to it in a second. We don't, sometimes we don't understand how important our faith in God's promises is really is to people around us right here is a really good example clear back in the beginning of time a little over 6,000 years ago a man had faith in God and we're still learning from that guy today he's still impacting people today Abel's faith is still speaking today listen you and I have no idea who we're going to impact with our faith when we refuse to compromise and, and we stand on the truth of God's word and we wait for his promises, we say, you know what? I'm not going to be like the world. I'm not going to blend into the world. I'm going to hold on to God's promises because God's got something better for me. And I'm not going to be molded and shaped by the society around me, but instead I'm going to stand true to God's word and I'm going to hold on to it. And you have no idea how many people that's going to impact when have around you every day and it starts with your family and it goes beyond that it is sometimes it's i remember a guy I, whenever i first got into the ministry i had this little book of sermons i was looking and digging and i was always seemed like i was struggling to come up with stuff to preach on those days are over but uh there was a sermon by the by a title that i never forgot i never used it it was in a little paperback book, and it was called uh, The Unintentional Witness. And a guy talked about how, as we go through life, there are lives that we reach that we never realized that we were reaching. It's not intentional. I remember sitting in a room one time on a construction site, building a Johnstown High School, sitting on the first floor of that school in a break room on a block at, at, at lunchtime and talking to a guy across the room about salvation in Christ. There were other guys in the room. They were chatting back and forth. I don't even know what they were talking about. And and as far as I knew, they were not even listening. 
the break time ended, we went back to work, and as I'm walking down the hallway to go back to where I was working, one of the guys caught up with me that had nothing to do with the conversation, and he said this to me. He said, hey, I was listening to what you were saying in there. He said, I'd like to hear more about that. And, and he said, I heard, he said something like this, I heard you offered tapes, I think it was tapes back then, to one of the guys that we were working with. He said, do you have any of those tapes that I could get? And I say that to say this, I had no idea that guy was even listening. He was in another conversation. It's an unintentional mis- ministry. The point is this, we don't know who we're going to impact with our faith. A lot of times, now I know this, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. People got to hear the truth. But I want to tell you something, your faith will have, without even saying anything sometimes, your faith will have a major impact on people around you. Let me get back here, if I could. Let me get you this next line here. Now, there's something else here that we need to see, and I want to show you again the definition of faith. Here's what was in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the substance or the foundation of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I want to show you how that applied in Abel's life. That foundation that he stood on was so very important in his life. Watch this. Abel's faith was the foundation upon which he stood upon, or upon which he stood upon as he continued to follow God in, in his day. We need to understand his life was not easy. You and I look at Abel and you say, yeah, I know, you know, his brother killed him. Well, before that, it was tough. Watch this. 1 John 3, 11 and 12 say this, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Watch this. Abel was hated by his own brother, because Abel's lifestyle convicted Cain. And let me tell you, that wasn't a thing that, he didn't just start hating him on one day, and then kill him in the afternoon. This was a battle. He he despised, Cain despised his brother for a long time. You know that day that he killed him, in the original text here, if we were to read down through that, on the day that he killed his brother, that was a, that was a setup. He set up a, a specific appointment with his brother that was premeditated murder. He planned it out ahead of time. He planned, he set up the meeting with his brother, planned to meet him in the field and to kill him that day. Premeditated murder because his lifestyle convicted his brother. That was difficult living under those, situ- those circumstances. It went on. Watch this. Not only that, then on top of this, Jesus tells us Abel was a prophet. In Luke eleven fifty 50 and 51, here's what we read. That the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. Abel was a prophet. You know what that means? He's a spokesman for God. Hey, on top of all of that, watch this. He lived in the midst of a godless society. Remember what Cain said? Let me show you what society was like. If we were to go on in Genesis and we were to come to 414 after God puts him out and he goes out to the land of Nod, the land of wandering. It's what happens to those that reject God. But watch this. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass. Now watch this statement. That everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Wait a minute. Cain says, everybody that finds me is going to want to kill me. How could he say that if it was just Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel? Well, there were far more people. You see, we don't know how far along in their life that this account to where to where this account took place let me say this god's grace in patience may have been extended to him for a long period of time and finally god said you know what enough's enough we're i'm not enough and and cain needs to be confronted on this and and so we're going to do that and so by this time adam and eve had far, far more children who then you got to realize they're close to the fountainhead of creation and there was no problem with a guy marrying his sister. You understand that? There was no problem with incest because we're close to the fountainhead of creation and so therefore there's no genetic problem with that whatsoever. That, the uh, incest was forbidden much later. 
So a, a lot of times people say, well, who did Cain marry? Well, he could have married his sister. It wouldn't have made any difference back there. It wouldn't have made any difference. But the whole point is this. There is a tremendous population by this time, and that population by that statement that Cain makes there is extremely godless. Because Cain says, everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Listen, you don't have to worry about that today. We can go out into the world, certain parts of the world, that would be, a, that would be something that we would fear. But as far as out in our society, you don't have to worry about that. But Cain said, look, you're going to put me out into society and everyone that finds me is going to slay me. That's what society was like. So Abel's a prophet in the midst of that. Abel is a prophet in the midst of that society. And he's hated by his brother, and you can be sure of this. He's hated by many that are in that society. So don't think that Abel had an easy life. It was far from being easy. Watch this next statement. His faith was the foundation he stood upon, and also the evidence of things unseen. Listen to me. You say, how in the world did he do it? You know, Enoch said this. Enoch and, and Jude tells us what Enoch, how Enoch described the society of that day, and he used the word ungodly about four times. That's the only word that came to his mind. Ungodly, 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 ungodly. Uh, ungodly deeds, ungodly people, and just over and over and over again. That was the way that he described society. You go on in Genesis here, Genesis 4, and you run into a guy by the name of Lamech who kills somebody for really no reason at all. That's a just, it tells you what that first society was like. Here's Abel in the midst of that as a, as a spokesman for God. You say, how, what did he stand on? How did he do that? Right there, you got it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It was the foundation that he planted his feet on in the midst of that day. And that sustained him in the midst of that society. And then, it, you know, faith is also the evidence of things unseen. Let me read this. His faith was his testimony, and even today we can learn from his faith, for it yet speaketh. That's what his brother hated. His brother hated the faith he had. He despised it because it convicted him. You ever been around somebody like that? You ever been around somebody that just, for some reason, they don't like you? They won't say why, but you can tell just by the way they treat you, the way they talk to you. I can pretty much guess if you've never done anything to them and you're just living your life the way God calls you to live your life, here's what you can almost be sure of. Your lifestyle convicts them and they don't like it. And so you become the target. That's why, listen to me, that's why they hated Jesus. They couldn't find any fault in him whatsoever. And so they hated him and to the point they crucified him. It's no different for us. We're his body today. And boy, we could go on here, but I'm going to get you with a little short conclusion here. Here it comes. Abel was a wonderful example of how faith in our substitute, Christ, is required in, any, in order for anyone to be justified and for anyone to be able to worship God. Without that, it's not possible. Nobody can come into the presence of God without Jesus Christ, without being washed in the blood of the Lamb, without faith in Jesus Christ. Christ. Next week, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Enoch. Moses says some things in Genesis 5 about, uh, Genesis 5 about Enoch, but the writer of Hebrews says something that is a different twist on that. And so it's going to open up a whole new view of how Enoch's life impacted the people of his day. I'll get you that next week. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you tonight for what we are able to look at here. Lord, we're just starting into these examples of faith, and we see here with Abel the impact, the impact that he had. We see that his faith was a testimony to those around him. His brother rejected it. But, Father, we also see that his faith was the foundation upon which he stood. And, and so that faith was what saved him, allowed him, allowed you to be able to declare him righteous. And that faith 
was how he was able to worship you. Father, we thank you tonight that we don't have to slaughter a lamb. We don't have to bring a bloody sacrifice to you. For our sacrifice was made some 2,000 years ago when your son, the Lamb of God, died on the cross. And Father, we thank you that he died once for all that he has perfected us forever, that we don't have to work for our salvation. There's no work involved. That's the way of Cain. Father, we thank you that it's by faith, and whenever we put our faith in him, that we are declared righteous once and for all, forever righteous, and that any time we desire, we can come right into your presence because of what our Savior has done for us. We can worship you because of the faith that we have in him and the finished work that he has done on our behalf. Father, to say thank you just seems so little, thinking about all that we have. Take us home safely. Uh, give us a good week. Lord, bring us back on Sunday as we get back into the book of Revelation on Sunday morning. We'll praise you for what will be accomplished. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>